Not only do we get to do an original series episode this week, but we also get to do one of the best episodes of Star Trek. Okay, so before we get into that, just really, really quickly, um, Merry Christmas, folks, and Happy Holidays, however you celebrate the season. Thank you for sticking with us all year. We hope you'll stay with us again in 2024. I am not entirely sure what day this is going to go out on because we're in that amorphous God only knows what day it is period. That is the end of December that goes into January. So before we go on, so we will have podcasts dropping over the Christmas period. We have a very special episode with none other than Nana Visitor herself coming very soon. We will also have an episode with the frankly wonderful Elias Tufexis as well. So two really special episodes coming. We have a very special effectively retro ups and downs because it's in the past. Anyway, for 2023 in general, that will be coming too over the Christmas period. So even though we're off, you know, having a little bit of food and maybe a little bit of you've grown up juice, um, there will be more videos on the channel throughout the Christmas period. Right, are we done? Cool. Trouble with Tribbles. This is, this is a seminal episode of Star Trek. Comes right in the second season, written by David Gerald, who would then return for the animated series and was going to return for the next generation as well. You should totally watch Chaos on the Bridge. That's all I'm going to say about that. The Tribbles themselves are iconic. I mean, they are as iconic as Spock's ears at this point. For the 40th anniversary of Star Trek, this was be voted the best episode of Star Trek overall. So you're probably wondering to yourself, <laughs> Sean, what on earth do you have new to say about this episode? I mean, like, give us a chance, will you? We're going to go straight in with an up this week, and that is for the banter that's happening between Chekhov, Spock and Kirk in that opening scene. It's a little bit of an exposition dump. They're talking about the mission to Sherman's planet, which is a planet under effectively it's it's kind of smack bang in the middle of jurisdictions between Federation and the Klingons. This is following on from the earlier episode Errand of Mercy and there's sort of a it's not so much a power sharing but a power struggle. The reason this is an up is because in this very serious scene you're getting a light-hearted exchange between these three men. Um, a lot of Chekhov gets quite a bit to do in this episode because he also gets what would have been going to Sulu as well because George Takei was away filming another show. How dare he? Which is why he's not in this episode. There is... There, 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 there's one bit in this scene that I never thought I was going to hear Spock say. Spock makes a dick joke. Chekhov says, you know, we're going to be so close to Klingon space that you could smell them. And Spock says... That doesn't make any sense. You can't smell in space. Chekhov goes, I was making a little joke. And Spock goes, very little, Ensign. Spock, you bitch. Taken up. What I am, however, going to give a down for in this scene is Kirk's not very nice to Chekhov here. Because basically, there's an ongoing joke that I'm going to come back to. But there's an ongoing joke about Chekhov keeps claiming that the Russians did everything first. In this scene, he talks about how Ivan Burkov was one of the first people to discover... Oh, wait, no, 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 it's John Burke from the Royal Academy from Old Britain. And, you know, there's a bit of, oh, yeah, whatever. And Kirk just goes, is the rest of your memory this faulty? And even if it's meant as a joke, maybe the way it's played is a bit like, oh, okay, we were having a good time here. When Spock is funnier than you? This is all interrupted, of course, by the Priority One subspace message from Space Station K7. K7 taken up. This is, again, one of those iconic designs of Star Trek. Uh, in fact, I really like this little thing. It's kind of dumb, and I like it. Mr. Lurie is the organizer and the operator, if you like, of K7, but he's not the one who sent the distress call to the Enterprise. No, 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 that would be Nils Barris. <sighs> Before we get to Nils Barris, just a few really quick ones. The music over this scene, which was actually music that we would hear in the Doomsday Machine as well, it's got that, it's probably the last, um, tense moment of the episode and it really suits the mood. Kirk arrives and spends the rest of the episode in his lovely green wraparound uniform as well which taken up from me. Now 
full disclosure, I did want to wear that for this video, but maybe I can use my Q powers for a second. That would have been a bit of an issue. Nils Barris, first of all, he gets an up, right? Uh, because of how much I hated him in this episode. He is a whiny... <laughs> such a... I'm the king of my castle, you know, I'm throwing a tantrum, I'm stamping my feet, and, and he's getting nothing from Kirk. And in fact, poor Al Kirk, my second down now is for Kirk as well. Because what was going on? when it beamed into the office. I, I, I presume it was in the script, as opposed to William Shatner making a decision on the day. Storage compartment, storage compartment? What, what? Like, getting paid by the word or something? But that was, that was a bit odd. But he's such a, you know, frantically scrambling middleman that, you know, he thinks, he thinks he can sass Spock. You know, they're talking about the super duper important grain that is sort of the big MacGuffin of this episode. This grain has to be used. It's the only one that can grow on Sherman's planet. It's all been specially engineered. It is quattro to Nope, can't do it. This special wheat, quadro triticale, to give it its proper name. And yes, I practiced saying that a few times. I'm not going to lie. This special wheat is sort of the linchpin and you know Nils Barris wants security guards everywhere and it's so important and Kirk is just in one of the most menacing and slow communicator raises that I think I've ever seen in Star Trek because you can see how much he just wants to get away from this man he begrudgingly Kirk to Enterprise authorize two security guards for the station and not one more than that and everyone off duty can have a bit of shore leave. And, oh, just enjoyed the whole thing. Also, don't sass Spock. Barris is not very happy about this, as you can imagine, but Kirk decides, I've heard enough of this, and begins to walk out of the office, and Barris effectively is like, ah, you won't hear the last of this, or, you know, you don't, you can't disrespect me, or, and Kirk just goes, oh, I have never questioned the importance or the uh, intelligence of a Federation official. Uh, until now and just walks out up oh, this is one of the running gags kirk is a bitch in this episode and i love it uh, okay what i mean by that is that there's so many petty comments that he gets off in barris's direction uh, now it does right it's balanced because he does get it in the neck as well barely a scene later you've got admiral fitzpatrick from starfleet command going Kirk, just shut up and look after the grain, will you? Uh, which, by the way, I liked because Kirk is the captain of the Federation flagship. He is the big cheese, but he still works for the man. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, okay. You've got to get that little bit of reminder in every now and again. He does it in, you know, as I say, the pettiest, I don't have time for this sh mood for the whole episode. And I just, I just relate. Every now and again, I... I just want to film an ups and downs and I want to bring comedy and joy in. And then the man gets on my back and says, Sean, you forgot to hit record. You need to do that again. And I'm like, no, actually, that's fair. Kirk, perhaps understandably, makes a quick stop at the bar on K7 with Spock. And just as he's leaving, we see Chekhov and Uhura walk into the bar. And uh, first of all, I love, I love the first thing, which is, you know, Kirk says, well, you didn't waste any time. And Horace just goes, how often do I get shore leave? Take it up. I like the fact that she's able to speak to the captain like that. You know, it's like, yep, yeah, don't worry, superior officer and all that. And again, another one of Chekhov's, you know, oh, the Russians did that. Uh, 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 Quadro Triticale. Ah, sure, that was invented by Russia. Uh, you know, at this point, Spock and Kirk are just like, and away they went. Because apparently, according to Spock, it was, it actually traced back to 20th century Canada. But, yeah. Who's fact checking? I am. Ah, uh, the bar scene. So the first one, I, 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 I quite like. So we get the introduction of Cyrano Jones. Okay, I really dig Stanley Adams in this role. Uh, I think he's so over there. He kind of, he plays camp for the back seats and it really works. And when he's like, you know, oh, I'm gonna sell this, I'm gonna sell this. And like that jacket is a TARDIS. It's just like, there's just so many smuggler sections, which is great. And then, of course, out comes Bang the Klingon Drums of Doom, the first Tribble we ever see in Star Trek. 
it is, it's a scene that's taken on, obviously, iconic uh, standards, but this is Chekhov and O'Hara's first meeting with the Tribbles, the completely innocent, may I hold it, uh, you know, the, the little bit of banter between Cyrano Jones and the bartender, and, you know, kind of like, oh, six credits, ten credits. Cyrano getting his credits off the bartender, but then still giving the Tribble to Hora in the hope that, mm, 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 in the hope that the little lady, I know it was made in the 1960s, but it grates on me. Ah, oh, the little lady will show it to everyone, and then, you know, ah, oh, smart little lady. It's like... Shut up, Jones. Yeah, that bit's aged like milk and wasn't particularly good at the time. <laughs> but overall, the scene, you've got Ohora has the trouble, you know, thus setting up for ecological disaster in the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. Crap. Aboard the Enterprise, Kirk is reeling with the wonderful announcement that, nope, he's got to stick around K7. And then he gets a very important alarm, which is the arrival of the Klingons. Up oh, the Klingon D7 ship that's been added into. So just for the purposes of this review, I've been working for the remastered version. So in the original version, there was no on-screen Klingon ship and there was an AMT model of the USS Enterprise that sort of, it was stationary behind the station commander's window, which would make sense if they were orbiting at the same speed. Not so is the case here. Keep an eye out for the Enterprise, you see it move across the window. But, I digress, back to the Klingon D7 ship. The Battlecruiser is and has always been my favourite Klingon ship. Uh, so knowing that it was added back in deliberately for this remaster is brilliant. And it matches, well, as it should, it matches what you would expect of the D7 of the time. Now, to address, just really quickly, the trials and tribulations of, the, of, of it all, if you're wondering whether I'm going to go into, you know, a, you know, a, oh, keep out for that scene, keep a lookout for that scene, I'm actually not going to do that. Now, there's a very specific reason as to why I'm not going to do that, is that I have no doubt that we will be giving Trials and Tribulations its own retro ups and downs. So I'm sort of committing us to it there, but, but that's why I'm not going to go into that here, okay? But please believe me and trust me, it will get its own full episode, don't worry. And we can talk about how the ship used in that episode wasn't correct. We get to meet <laughs> William Campbell's Koloth for the first time. We'd met William Campbell before in Star Trek because, I mean, the definitely not a Q Trelane in The Squire of Gothos, also played by William Campbell. So great to see him back again. And yes, of course, would return to the role after some extensive cosmetic surgery years, years and later. Affable to the point of arrogant, but he's not particularly offensive. He just, you know, kind of butts heads a little bit with Kirk. But it's sort of like playful, <laughs> we could go to war at any moment kind of banter. Kirk says, while yes, he has absolutely no jurisdiction from stopping the Klingons from having a little bit of shore leave on the station, they have to keep it to groups of 12 and no more, and that Kirk will be assigning a security guard to every Klingon, except one of them. But he didn't know that yet. Aboard the Enterprise, they're starting to notice something about Uhura's new pet. For example, there's a ton of them now. In the rec room, mess hall, mess hall, we'll go with that, Kirk and Spock walk in to find initially Scotty sitting there, dewy-eyed, reading his technical manuals, which I love, taken up. As they then continue walking through the room, they see Uhura sat at a table, surrounded by crew members, surrounded by Tribbles. And Kirk is a bit like, why is that here? What have you brought that here for? What's going on? Stop it now. And Uhura, seemingly charmingly baffled by the fact that her one Tribble has multiplied by like 11 overnight, is just saying, oh, this is fascinating, isn't it? It's wonderful. And then you have Spock is sort of drawn to them. You can see there's a sort of a, I do like this thing, but I don't want to like it, but I'm st strangely drawn to it. Up, oh, and this is a cheeky up because we would see this again in Assignment Earth. When we find out, find out that Spock is a cat person. I like the seeds were dropped here. McCoy, appearing finally in this episode, arrives and basically asks, can I have one to study it? And Uhura's like, 
Sure, why not? You get a triple. You get a triple. All right, yeah, we should probably study these things before giving them out to the crew, maybe? So off McCoy goes, and McCoy starts to study, and the next thing, the one triple that he has multiplies as well. And he's like, well, sure, why would anyone be alarmed at this point of the story? No, really, it's, it's beginning to stretch belief at this point. Uh, poor El Kirk has just walked in because he's just got off another flipping phone call with Barris, who's like, Hey, Kirk, how's it going? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, listen, shut up. This is why you're a jackass. And it's just, oh, you do feel for Kirk. You really do in this episode. And I have to say, William Shatner plays a blinder in this episode because he plays, he plays a man who wants to be absolutely anywhere else then dealing with Tribbles or Klingons or bureaucrats. You know, he just wants to get back out into space. He's got important space stuff to do. He gets his drugs off McCoy and they're like, this is interesting. What's going on? McCoy has figured out at this point that about 50% of the Tribbles metabolism is just for reproduction. And that is, you know, that's gonna be the gift that keeps on giving this Christmas. Well, then there's a bit of a cut where Kirk's there in the transporter room and there's more guards to be sent down, but also more shore leave to be sent down. And there's Scotty going, yeah, yeah, you go and enjoy that shore leave. Yeah, yeah, Kirk says, yeah, you too. And he's like, ha, say what? Kirk forces Scotty to go on shore leave, which I kind of love because you can see how much he needs to go. Sure, it might not end well. But I, I appreciate it. He's a good captain looking out for his crew. Take a note for that. Himself, Lieutenant Freeman and Ensign Chekhov sit at a table and there's a, another, again, ongoing Russian, Russian joke. You've got Chekhov's drinking straight vodka. Fair play, buddy. Scotty's drinking scotch and they're discussing the merits of it. Meanwhile, you've got the Klingon officer Korax sitting there with some of his buddies as well. And then in the background, I am going to go into more detail on this, as I'm sure you're expecting, taking up for the uniforms that are on display in this scene. You look closely and you're going to see a little history of Star Trek in this scene. Cyrano Jones arrives and he's like, dear Mr. Federation man, will you have a triple? And Scotty's like, laddie, don't you think you should pass off? I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to every Scottish viewer right now. Jones then walks past the Klingons table and I have to give an up to Michael Pataki who gave the biggest, most theatrical jump while remaining in his seat that I think I've ever seen a Klingon give. Because when that triple shrieks, that Klingon looked like it was about to pull a batleth out of its... It looked like it was ready to fight. Jones goes over to the bar and Korax decides now is the time to start some shit. Talks about how much he doesn't like Earthers. Talks about how much he doesn't like one Earther in particular. And you can see the vein on Chekhov's head during all of this, because Chekhov is the little young hot-headed ensign, isn't he? So, you know, you're, insult you're insulting my captain? My captain. Oh my God, I'm gonna punch you so hard it does absolutely nothing. Thankfully, Scotty's on board to say, Everyone's entitled to an opinion, laddie. Down. My accent. Another down. Scotty full-on steals Freeman's drink. Sorry, has anyone else noticed this in this scene? He's there, you know, check off, basically sit down, relax. Check off's knocked back his vodka. So Scotty reaches over, takes Freeman's scotch, hands it to Chekhov, who then proceeds to take a massive gulp. Freeman does nothing. Sure, he's terrified for his job. And I just thought, down, of all things, a Scotsman doesn't steal another person's drink. But we don't have time to dwell on such things because Korax makes his terrible, terrible mistake. Initially, he says, the Enterprise should be hauling garbage. A laddie, don't you think you should rephrase that? You're right, I should. I didn't mean to say that the Enterprise should be hauling garbage. I meant to say it should be hauled away as garbage. Anyway, one of the most fun fights in Star Trek history completely erupts. Taken up. It's brilliant. Come on. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's a whole bunch of Starfleet officers fighting a whole bunch of Klingons. It should be over in about three seconds, but television. So the Klingons don't immediately slaughter everyone in the room because they're nice. It, it's kind of hard to describe. It just is what it is. It is a brawl in a bar and Cyrano Jones just walking through the room going, I'll have that drink, 
thank you very much, and is about to leave. And then, you know, a whole bunch of security officers come in, barman gets in, says, I'll have that, takes it straight out of his hand. Cyrano Jones turns around from his TARDIS jacket, pulls out another drink and drinks it. End of scene. Absolutely brilliant. We go straight then to the lineup where you have all of the officers in a row. Yes, this was one of the more fun ones in Trials and Tribulations, but that's it. You got Scotty, you got Chekhov, and you got Freeman, who's about to get erased from history, seemingly, who says, I don't know who threw the, threw the first punch. Kirk goes, Chekhov, you threw the first punch, didn't you? I don't know, sir. Love it. Perfect. Anyway, they're all confined to quarters, but not you, Scotty. Scotty, come back here for a second. And we get what is my favorite exchange of the episode. So, taken up. Scotty was defending the honor, a matter of pride. He was defending the Enterprise. Take a latinum up this entire scene. It, it, the two of them are brilliant. Don't get me wrong, James Doohan is amazing. But the look on Kirk's face when he realizes that Scotty wasn't defending Kirk's honor, he was defending the Enterprise's honor. And, the whole, and it ends with, great, I'll get a chance to catch up my technical manuals. Mm. Perfect scene. Loved it. Lighten them up. We see an exchange between Spock and McCoy that quite frankly could have been sort of chopped and put. Once the troubles start uh, multiplying, it could be kind of placed anywhere in the episode. And I'm not going to hang... If, if I hang up too much on this, I'll never get through an episode of the original series. I love Leonard McCoy. McCoy is an asshole to Spock. Like... Like, he's really trying to jab the needle. Now, Spock's given as good as he gets, but I have to say, Spock's in the right in this scene. Spock has the dribble, he's disquieted by the dribble because all they seem to do is eat and breed. And McCoy goes, did you have a feeling? Don't be insulting, Doctor. And, and it's, it's, these people do not like each other at all. And this scene is really good, even if poor McCoy does not come across very well here at all. But of course, Spock, as always, gets the last word. McCoy says, I have learned one thing about Tribbles. Oh, I like them more than I like you. And Spock goes, they do have one redeeming feature, Doctor. They do not talk. And then leaves. Mm. Well done. You fight for yourself, Spock. Kirk gets up to the bridge. The bridge is now overrun with Tribbles. Really think we should be paying attention to the Tribble problem, folks. Anyway, so we get that great scene. If he sits in the chair, the Tribble shrieks, and that just sets him up with sort of a PTSD for like the rest of time. He calls McCoy to the bridge, and he's like, I want them off my ship. What's going on? I want them off my ship. We get an exchange. McCoy says, look, I've discovered they seem to be bisexual and have energy for breeding. And boy, do they have an appetite for it. Kirk's like, that's fabulous. Get rid of them. They don't offer anything. And then we get one of the cringiest moments of the episode. Oh my God. Down, Uhura, who is a fiercely intelligent woman, who met Cyrano Jones three seconds ago at a bar, says, oh, but they do have something to offer us. They offer us love. And after all, Cyrano Jones says that love, triple love, is the only love money can buy. Whopper of a trillium down. It is such a stinker of a scene. And it's just like, don't, don't, don't do that to Uhura. Don't, don't do that. Because they kind of make her feel like a freshman. The scene, thankfully, ends quickly. They, they round up Cyrano Jones, who makes the arguably fair argument of, well, you know, what have I done wrong? I'm not transporting dangerous animals. They don't even have teeth. For now, Cyrano Jones walks out. Uh, you have, oh, Barris is back again. Back again! Delighted to see Barris. Uh, one man, of course, who I haven't mentioned so far is Arn Darwin. Well, I did sort of mention him earlier. Remember that one Klingon who didn't have a security guard following him? But Charlie Brill plays him. Again, that bureaucratic, mm, I've got more power than you have. You're a bad person. And you've got Barris there to be like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they're bad. I'm holding you responsible, Kirk. And you can tell Kirk is being really, really good and trying not to train phasers on this man. Back aboard the... There's a lot of back and forth. Thing. Back aboard the Enterprise, you they walk in and they realize... They, you know, it's back in the mess hall and Kirk's trying to get his chicken sandwich and coffee and comes out with tribbles in it. The next thing we cut to Scotty walking in going, Aye, they're in the machinery, all right? My accent is dreadful. Saying that, you know, they've obviously got in through the vents. That's when the penny drops. There's vents aboard the station into the storage areas with the Quattro Triticale. Triticale. 
with the Quattro Triticale. Oh, crap. And so they realize. And so they beam over there. There's, you know, thankfully, I will say, they beam over to the station manager's office and they're holding a whole bunch of tribbles. So I will say, delighted the transporter works an awful lot better than uh, Kovic's telepods that we would see two decades later. They get to the storage door. Kirk opens the door. Kirk gets absolutely swallowed by Tribbles. Uh, and, it, and it's so fun, because uh, it, it's so stupid. It's just literally, it's just Teddy after Teddy after Teddy after Teddy dumps down on William Shatner's head. And we get this, this great, McCoy runs in and says, I know what we do, don't feed him. And the whole room looks at him and he's like, ah. As Kirk says, now he tells me. Uh, but that's when they discover many of these are dead or dying as McCoy finds out when he scans them. And Kirk sort of twigs it. And someone, close that door, up. The final scene that takes place aboard K7 sees everyone come together in Mr. Lurie's office. You've got Nils Barris, you've got Koloth, you've got Korax, you've got Spock, you've got Kirk, you've got Cyrano Jones, and you've got some Tribbles. Tribbles don't like Klingons, as we know. Koloth's like, ha, ah, you, you need to apologize to us. You've basically just handed us Sherman's planet. Ha ha, the Klingon Empire wins. Ha ha ha. Iron Darvin, get out of the room. Get out of the room. He does not get out of the room in time. And Kirk troubles him. And again, it's so funny that they're so uncomfortable. It's so scared. They're Klingons. Yeah, he's exposed as a Klingon. Turns out, yes, he's the one. He poisoned all the grain and in a way to destabilize efforts for Sherman's planet. What I love so much about this scene is, as, as fun as the reveal is, everything like that, William Shatner's performance in this scene as Kirk, as the cat who got the cream, when he's like, I get to make every one of your lives as difficult as you've made mine these last couple of days. I love it so much. It's possibly the happiest I've ever seen Kirk. And it's brilliant because he's walking around with the tribbles. He's like, I think I just learned to love these tribbles. <laughs> Nils Barris. Yeah, you're not even worth my time. Okay, grad. And then, you know, Koloth has nothing to say. What can he say? Kirk orders him out of Federation space. He's got six hours to comply. You know, as you know, as we find out, Iron Darwin doesn't do too well out of this. Back aboard the Enterprise and we get the immortal line. You know, what do you do? I'd use the transporter. <gasps> Mr. Scott, you didn't beam them into space. No, Captain. I beamed them into the Klingon's engine room. Well, there'd be no trouble at all. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a war. War. Um, with that strange ending, let's head to temporal observations. <laughs> yeah, I, I've mentioned already the, the, the trials and tribulations of it all. Okay, so rather than spend effectively what will be temporal observations doing an ups and downs of trials and tribulations, uh, I will of course mention that this episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, was so profound that it was a somewhat easy choice for this celebration for the 30th uh, anniversary of Star Trek. They, they found a way because of the connection where Sulu's not in this episode, so Voyager did flashback which had Sulu, Grace Lee Whitney, I onto the events of the Undiscovered Country that this ended up being one of the best ways of celebrating just what Star Trek could be. Which is really interesting when you think about how initially pff, no one liked it. it, it, it let, let me expand. Uh, Gene Kuhn didn't really like it initially. Gene Roddenberry didn't really like it initially. Herb Solo didn't really like it initially. Robert Justman didn't really like it initially. David Gerald, God bless his little cotton socks, he loved it. You know, he was like, I've done a good job on this script. Now it was, it was quite heavily rewritten by Gene Kuhn, but you know, he wanted to, Gerald then pitched a sequel for the third season of Star Trek, but producer Fred Freiberger didn't really like it. Despite all of that in the beginning, The Trouble with Tribbles has a massive impact on Star Trek for the next 50 odd years. We would see the Tribbles again in the animated series episode, More Tribbles, More Troubles, which also would see the return of Stanley Adams as Cyrano Jones, one of only three guest stars to come back in the animated series alongside 
Mark Leonard and Robert C. Carmel. The Tribbles would appear in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. You see them in the bar when McCoy is trying to barter a ship. They're in the J.J. Abrams Star Trek in 2009, and then, I have to talk about this one, don't I? In Star Trek Into Darkness, Khan's magic blood brings a dead Tribble back to life. There. They actually make a very cameo-esque appearance in Enterprise. Uh, so you're kind of thinking, well, hang on, that's like a hundred years before the trouble with Tribbles. In it, you see, it's quite grim, really. You've got Phlox feeding a Tribble to one of his pets, as Hoshi's a bit like, well, that's gross. What is funny as well is that one of the original concepts for the Tribbles would see them with teeth. Uh, but then in the actual episode, they say, Tribbles have no teeth. I would say, give it time, because in Star Trek Picard's third season episode, The Bounty, when they're walking through Daystrom Station, that attack trouble scares the absolute Jesus out of Worf, and rightly so. I mean, this is no mere trouble. This is gonna eat your face. And, you know, finally I see that, yeah, I understand why the Klingons don't like the Tribbles. Certainly not in this scene. That, of course, you know, this is one of the one of the reasons that this episode is so, you know, tied into so much of Star Trek history. You know, they've brought the Tribbles back. Thank you very much. Trip through the Bajoran Orb of Time, Deep Space Nine, reintroduce the Tribbles. And, you know, I do love the fact that in that episode they joke, we could build... Never mind. It is revealed there that the Klingons wiped out all of the Tribbles by the end of the 23rd century. Which, when you think about the fact that this episode is set in the 2260s, that's pretty efficient. They do say the Klingons are efficient in this episode. Actually, the animated series episode, More Troubles, More Troubles, which sees the return of Koloth, although this time played by James Doohan, take a shot every time James Doohan voiced a character in the animated series, you see that aboard the IKS Divisor, which would of course be later renamed the IKS Groff, thank you very much, Draws and Tribulations, they're on a hunt to destroy this ecological menace and they, you know, this is the introduction of the Glomer, which made an appearance in Star Trek Lower Decks recently. It's as silly as it sounds, but they're like locusts. They arrive, they consume. In the same way that people attempt to curb the population of locusts, that's what the Klingons are trying to do, at least in the animated series. And maybe they took it a wee bit too far. And you can imagine how they felt when they were brought back. The short Trek episode, The Trouble with Edward, sort of introduces a bit of a spanner here as well. That is because the Tribbles were genetically engineered by Edward Larkin to reproduce the way that they do. This saw the, well, the destruction of a starship, which is quite embarrassing really, but also the start of a long-running series of gags on Trek culture. Yes, the USS Cabot might not have survived, but huh, quite frankly, I got some gags out of it. Now, timeline-wise, this is set around, you know, the late 2250s. Spock does say that tr having traced Cyrano Jones's career for the previous seven years, it's seen him, you know, break some rules, but trade in relatively legal items, including troubles. So that does suggest that Starfleet was at least somewhat aware if not directly aware of Tribbles by then. Perhaps with the embarrassing fate of the Cabot, one could understand why it's not really... The Omega Directive, it is not. Koloth, of course, who first appears here, played by William Campbell in a returning part, Trelane Koloth, would then return once again in Deep Space Nine in the episode Blood Oath. Here he would reprise the role of Koloth, but they they did, uh, there was an interview with John Kalikos where he talked about coming back as core. And uh, he said, yeah, having the rank of Dahar Master did not get you out of having to sit in the make makeup chair. So effectively, by the second season of DS9, oh sure, yeah, Klingons have changed, but we don't care enough to make you in the original makeup. And actually I say that because Koloth's makeup is probably one of the least offensive Klingon uh, styles of makeup in the original series, if you think about it. Like, sure, we've still got that Mongolian-inspired look that they went for in Errand of Mercy, but at least he's not sitting there under five layers of fake tan. But yet, yeah, when he comes back, he, you know, he looks like he could be Martok's brother. Speaking of Errand of Mercy, the Organian Peace Treaty is mentioned several times. Of course, the Organians 
were these non-corporeal uh, beings who effectively forced peace between Starfleet and the, and the Klingon Empire in Errand of Mercy. But we would see them again in the likes of Enterprise, where a couple of Organians effectively possessed Hoshi and Reed at one point. I just love this uniform. The uniforms that we see in the most famous bar fight in Star Trek are a mix of everything that had really been available up to that point. So let's see, you've got Scotty, Freeman and Chekhov are in your then standard Starfleet uniforms. Lovely. But if you look throughout the rest of the room, you'll see this couple of people wearing these. These were introduced in the cage and reused again in Where No Man Has Gone Before. You see people wearing what I can only, I'm going to call it the Finnegan. Right, so that's from the episode Shore Leave, and Finnegan, who's conjured up out of Kirk's memory, is wearing the sparkliest kind of silver blue I've ever seen. And there's a couple of people wearing those. You've got versions of the original series uniform that bear the Antares logo, the so reuse of those. And then you also have people wearing those jumpsuits, those onesies that you would have seen in episodes like The Devil in the Dark. So this is sort of a best of in terms of uniforms up to this point. There's also a mention of the Battle of Donatu V, the results of which were inconclusive. Now, Donatu V has come up several times. To Kuvma, when making his battle cry in the Battle of the Binary Stars, cites Donatu V as one of his reasons. Timeline-wise, that adds up fine, because he's speaking in the late 2250s, the Battle of Donatu V took place in the 2240s. So timeline-wise, absolutely fine. By the time we go ahead to the 2370s, we get an episode of Deep Space Nine, Sons and Daughters, where the Rotaran is tasked with protecting an envoy en route to Donatu V. We get one of those little gangs as well that Chekhov was talking about Scotch, and he said it was invented by a little old lady in Leningrad, which I love that they recycled that joke in Star Trek Beyond. But when it was uttered in 1967, Leningrad was still a place. Leningrad was the then, well, not, not new, but then it was the renamed city of St. Petersburg after the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution of 1917, and the rise of Vladimir Lenin, it was renamed to Leningrad. Now, at the fall of the USSR in the early 1990s, that would then be renamed to St. Petersburg. So technically, Chekhov's making a deep cut in this scene. But the fact that they reused the joke in Star Trek Beyond, actually, I, I like that they've just kept that little bit of that historical gag. And of course, it's always fun to think of Anton Yelchin. So I really appreciate it for that. So obviously they didn't know that when they were making the trouble with Tribbles. It has retroactively become a lovely little tie-in tribute. There's other little site references throughout, which obviously normally I go and I list and I list and I list. But with this one, it's more the impact of the episode. It's launched fandoms. It's aged very well. It was this wonderful piece to be used for the anniversary. And quite frankly, having rewatched it a couple of times now for this, it's just fun. Hopefully I've sold you on it to go back and give it a rewatch now. <laughs> Folks, from all of us here at Trek Culture, from myself, have a wonderful rest of 2023. As I said, there's more stuff coming, so don't you worry about that, but look after yourselves. We're going to have a wonderful 2024. We'll make sure we do. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thank you for all of the support this year. Have a good one. Make it so. Quadrotritically. Quadrotrically. Quadrotically. Quadrotrically. Quadrotrically.